Being a nuclear professional is more than just understanding nuts and bolts in the power plant, pumps and valves. There's a human part to the business that's of equal importance. Here at UOIT and our faculty, we use the experience base of our uh, faculty members to bring some of that learning to the classroom. I think the earlier you can begin understanding some of what it takes to be a nuclear professional, the better you are able to step into industry and be a highly effective performer early on in your career. In the slide behind me, you see some of the attributes of of the behaviors around being a nuclear professional. You can see the things that are important, like a unrelenting focus on nuclear safety, uh, both core and for people safety. I'll speak in a few minutes about the people safety aspect. But high standards and a commitment to high standards, a focus on compliance with the rules. One of the other activities that I, uh, I engage in is I'm currently the chair of the Strategic Steering Committee for the Canadian Standards Association Nuclear Branch of Standards. The faculty here stays engaged in uh, industry and service activity so that we can stay current with uh, issues uh, that are important and we can bring that into the learning opportunity. In nuclear, one of the things that sets the nuclear business aside from many others is the, the behavior of being open to critical review. We can simulate that here at UIT everywhere from how we grade to how we give feedback to students for oral presentation. Uh, in our, in our, uh, this morning in our, our thesis work, we had students uh, reporting uh, to an audience of the work they'd done in their thesis uh, work over the past semester. And we build these kind of things into the way we interact with students to make the, the learning opportunity real. Ethical behavior, of, co of course, it sounds simple, but it's being honest and always be guided by that moral central uh, premise of doing the right thing. So we blend this in with the technology aspect of, of the uh, nuclear education here at the school. So you can see here that it it is around about understanding the kind of behaviors important to some of those things on the last slide. This uh, slide comes from some of the work I've done in uh, leadership training around the world. I've had the opportunity to, uh, to lecture in uh, uh, audiences in Romania and China as well as uh, uh, throughout North America. And we talk about what it is that the behaviors of a nuclear engineering professional have to be to be able to get the outcomes that we want in the industry. So again, we use this as a platform of learning here at the school. Uh, respect for the reactor. In our under, undergraduate uh, uh, lecturing, we talk about how important it is to make sure that in everything we do, that we pay attention to the, the reactor core. It really sets our technology uh, apart. Uh, Commitment to quality. Uh, in our, again, in our thesis uh, work, we have students uh, learn about how important it is to be uh, conscious of things like making sure that you pay attention to the requirements part of the project, that we manage it with interface with the stakeholders well. You can see some of the other things. I spoke about my role in CSA and adherence to codes and standards. You'd find in our undergraduate uh, and graduate learning opportunities here that we take students right back from the science fundamentals right back into the codes and standards base that the industry is heavily uh, reliant on to do its work. Codes and standards, of course, are one way we capture the, the knowledge of our of our, the people who have went before us, the learnings that have come from years and years of operation of these facilities. Uh, reporting mistakes, uh, we'll see in a moment when we, when we talk about uh, uh, human error and we talk about uh, health and safety in the workplace. If you're not reporting mistakes that are inconsequential, it's hard to avoid the big ones. Industry uses this as a fundamental premise to how it conducts its business. 
uh, reporting these things that uh, as an individual uh, event, it doesn't seem like it's very significant, but if you aggregate and you look at patterns, they can be quite significant. When we look at uh, all of the, the big uh, events in, in industry, uh, we see that these kind of things have a tendency to accumulate. I think one of the greatest uh, case studies for this kind of behavior actually is the movie Titanic, and we use that uh, the Titanic story as one of the uh, case studies that we look at in uh, some of our coursework on uh, nuclear safety. Of course, learning from others is important. Uh, important not only in nuclear, but all engineering disciplines. So we start to build in uh, the, the thought processes around research so that if you have a problem, look to see if somebody's already solved it before, it makes the job a whole lot uh, easier. Uh, t today you hear a lot about risk management and uh, you know risk management you can look at it in a number of ways. You can look at it as, uh, as understanding what risks are and putting the right kind of barriers in place or equally I suppose in some disciplines you can look at risk management as looking at the opportunity and then going after it. I suppose that you know, making money in the stock market is a risk management kind of endeavor. And uh, the behavior that you would have around that kind of entrepreneurial style of thinking is quite different than the thought processes we, we need to use in nuclear. So we'll see in a moment here that we start to talk about these thought processes and behaviors as part of the educational programming. One of the theories that we uh, share with our students and, and review on our case study work is the notion that today's results might not be a uh, predictor of the future. So track record is certainly important, but when you look at future results, you need to look at the behavior of the professionals and the leaders that will influence what happens tomorrow. So I can, for example, if I'm uh, driving to work every day, I can have an attitude of complying with the, the uh, Traffic Safety Act. I can comply with speed limits. Or I can speed every day. Now, if I choose the latter and I'm speeding, the way we're set up here in Ontario is that periodically my behavior will be adjusted by an event. That event might be a speeding ticket or it might be an accident. Of course, in our nuclear business, we're not looking at taking risks. We're looking at managing risks to get predictable outcomes. So we need quite a different view of the world in nuclear as we do in some of the other uh, you know, risk-taking ventures. So we look at the behavior in today's time domain as a predictor of results in the future. So if I'm not complying with rules today, I might, in fact, as the speeder does who has not got a speeding ticket, I might be getting what appears to be good overall performance today. But that very behavior that appears to give good performance today, in fact, can be the exact behavior that gives you problems with outcomes tomorrow. That kind of concept we build into the learning opportunities in lecture, assignment, and project work in our third and fourth year activities to help students understand the thought processes that support the industry as well as providing them a good understanding of the technological base of the industry. A wise gentleman named James Reason characterized this kind of thought in a slightly different way. He is often referred to as being the inventor of the Swiss cheese model. It's really a classical barrier analysis. What it says is if you have a danger or a, an outcome that you want to prevent, the first step is to identify what that is and then put a number of barriers in place so that that outcome is protected from happening. Of course, the more significant the, the uh, negative outcome, the larger number of barriers. Because as the model shows, no barrier is perfect. 
In fact, you can think of barriers as changing in effectiveness over time. Uh, again, if I use the Titanic story, and if you think the danger is, is potential to hit an iceberg, and you say, well, what kind of barriers do I have in place to prevent that? You know, if you watch the movie, uh, look at the segment where the, the lookout personnel are in the crow's nest and supposed to be watching for icebergs, a classical defense barrier that would have prevented that particular accident if, in fact, it was effective. But what was happening that night on the ship, there was a party going on, it was cold outside, the captain was entertaining the guests, and what were the two gentlemen in the crow's nest focusing on? Their duty to look for icebergs? or the activities going on in the nice warm enclose of the ship. And of course, uh, you've no doubt seen the story. They, they're talking about uh, the party, and then uh, too late, they identify the iceberg glooming ahead. So that that's, uh, can be characterized by a hole in this barrier. And that hole can change with time. Now, I suppose another night, perhaps, when there wasn't a party going on on the Titanic, perhaps that, that uh, barrier was uh, very effective and, and uh, had the voyage been on another night or the party hadn't happened, maybe that one barrier would be sufficient to prevent that catastrophe. So if you stack those barriers, the probability of accident should decrease. You can think of another barrier in the Titanic story that in the Seaman's Handbook of the day, the captain was supposed to be on the bridge of the vessel any time that the vessel might be in danger. It was also in the seaman's handbook of the day that the speed of the vessel was supposed to be controlled to be appropriate for the, the hazard condition. So you can see that this kind of model we can apply to really any kind of industrial setting, whether it's, you know, racing vehicles, running uh, big ships on the ocean. And certainly it has an application in the kind of industry that we're in, the nuclear industry, where we want to prevent damage to the plant, release of uh, radioactivity, uh, or harm to human beings and the environment. So this part of the learning, the kind of the human side of the learning, is absolutely an essential component as well as the science fundamentals and the systems. Part of my role here at the university as uh, an associate professor, a nuclear engineer in residence, is to uh, help in the, uh, the, both the education aspect of uh, the operation of the university and with the, uh, think of administrative part of uh, running a, a school of this size. The, uh, the role that I have here at the university also includes being a Joint Health and Safety Committee representative and uh, part of our own faculty uh, safety and health advisory committee to the dean. So the concept that I just talked about, about reducing the probability of occurrence of uh, unwanted event or an, with negative consequence, also applies in conventional safety. On the screen here, you see a, uh, a classical model used in the uh, nuclear industry for years in the, in the conventional safety area. And, and what it really says is for every one really significant event, there are several times more less significant events that if you recognized and put those kind of barriers in that Reason talked about, we could actually prevent severe in injury to workers and, in our case, students. Uh, I think part of uh, the educational environment that is really important to create is that there's the flexibility to learn, but also that safety and security to give an environment that that learning can be uh, executed in a way that our students and staff uh, safety is maintained as, as paramount for our institution. Uh, very committed to uh, student safety and 
Uh, hence, I, I'm uh, really happy to have the opportunity to work with the health and safety professionals here to uh, continue to develop and improve our uh, safety program at the school. So you can see that you know, if, you're, if you're looking for behavior and low level event reporting, 3,000 opportunities to identify before you have that slip and fall or step in front of a car, or whatever the accident might be. So we can take some of the concepts that we're uh, teaching in our uh, nuclear uh, syllabus and we can bring that human uh, safety aspect uh, to play. I think it's particularly important in the nuclear sector because uh, our nuclear power plants uh, in Canada enjoy uh, not only great performance in terms of nuclear safety and uh, environmental stewardship, but also leaders in the area of uh, worker safety. So in preparing our students to fit into that world, again, UOIT is a, uh, you know, has the, the uh, advantage perhaps of being a school that is targeted with its programs on a particular sector. So we can help prepare the students to have this kind of healthy respect for safety that's so important to you and I, uh, if we're parents or uh, you know, a brother or sister, we, you know, we hear in the paper where there's uh, periodically an industrial accident or a, an accident at a school with a student. And uh, you know, we're proud here to be building this into our programming so that our students will hold that as part of their deeply held belief and value system to step into industry to help these uh, companies maintain that good performance. So little things make a big difference. Uh, I typically start my lecture with a, you know, with a few minutes of a reflection on some kind of safety aspect that uh, is important uh, uh, either in daily life or in our, uh, uh, our uh, power plants. Uh, that kind of technique is widespread in, uh, in our nuclear industry here in Canada. So our students begin to see how it feels to operate in uh, industry just like uh, uh, they're going to after they graduate. We build this kind of thinking into the design process. So of course it's not good enough simply to have safe designs of equipment uh, for nuclear safety purposes, but they also, uh, whatever we build in power plants, have to be uh, able to be operated safely by the the operators that operate and maintained safely by maintainers. So building this kind of concept and thinking into our uh, uh, academic syllabus is important. As part of my job with uh, Joint Health and Safety Committee, we do inspections of our laboratories. We uh, look at the equipment, everything from eyewash stations, functional to fire extinguishers in the right place. And we also look for student behavior in our laboratories so that we see that the students are uh, paying attention to the kind of things that will protect them here and in their future career uh, from any injury in the workplace. As you probably well know, we're, we're blessed here in Ontario with legislation, the Occupational Health and Safety Act, which uh, legislates requirements for employers and gives our, uh, our workers the, uh, some rights, in particular the right to refuse work if they believe it's unsafe. So bringing it again into our environment and emulating some of that so that they're uh, familiar with what it takes to be uh, a nuclear professional and look at safety in the workplace not as an option but in preparing our students for uh, the workplace of tomorrow, it's just become normal in the nuclear industry that you know, health and safety, stewardship for the environment, and high levels of performance aren't an add-on. That's just part of everything we do. And I believe here at UOIT we can help our students prepare so that there is more of a seamless transition into that kind of environment.